Welcome back to the Paddock Prince Dish ahead of Keeneland Racecourse opens for its fall meeting. Not quite the Breeders' Cup meeting because, David, we will be back at Churchill in between Keeneland ending and Breeders' Cup beginning. But nevertheless, definitely fall in the air, winning your in races. This, to me, is the best meet of the bluegrass. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Obviously, you got the big fall stars weekend with all these preps of the Breeders' Cup. We have turf racing back in Kentucky, all the jockeys and big trainers ship in. So there's going to be a lot going on the next couple of weeks at Keeneland leading up to obviously the Breeders' Cup and looking forward to it. Yeah. And uh, did you cross the wire ahead for Churchill? <laughs> you know, I think I collapsed on the last two days, like an epic collapse. And I haven't done the exact math, but I think I was a dollar ninety nine. So I don't know yeah. if that that's close, but I think my epic yeah. collapse two days was um It's good, but you know, we can't say you beat the meat like you did at Saratoga. But yeah, Buck ninety nine really strong. Those last two days were tough. Uh Joe Christofek, who does uh the, the picks for Churchill Downs, uh he was uh going into the last week with a positive ROI as well. And he ended up falling short. So tough racing to close it out, uh, but that sometimes means big prices. And we certainly look forward to those at Keeneland as well. And speaking of prices, the news today, we're recording this on Wednesday, new morning line odds maker at Keeneland, replacing Mike Battaglia after 48 years is Nick Tamaro, who's done the line at Sam Houston. He's done some consulting work for bookmakers, making a fixed odds line. Uh, certainly no offense to Mike, who's a legend, but this is a positive step if you use morning lines in your handicapping. Yeah, absolutely. I felt felt like the last couple of years you would open a form with a morning line and you'd be like 15 to 1 on a horse and you're like, wait, no way. They go off at 5 to 2 and they win. So I think there's been a lot of that recently at, um, on Kentucky circuits. And obviously Nick is a really smart handicapper and horse person. So I think he will do a very good job. Um, I mean, Keelan obviously has a big following. I would probably compare it to Saratoga almost in a way following wise. So I'm sure he'll make a few mistakes to Twitter to let him know about, but overall I'm sure he'll do a great job. Here's hoping. And uh, now I'm guessing when you do most of your work, you actually don't see the line. No, because it comes out. It's hard to wait for the morning line because then it would really back up the work because they don't come out till you know, a day and a half, two days before. So I do, pr I mean, sometimes I'll go back and look to make sure I'm not completely off with things, but no, I don't usually use a morning line. All right. Obviously we want everyone to go and uh, get the whole meat. Uh, the squirrels at the bottom there. You can uh, subscribe to David's meat long package. Also have aqueduct up and running, heading into the breeders cup. So uh, want everyone to check out the Friday car, 10 races. It ends with the pick three uh, before scratches, 16, 14 and 13 horses so uh, hopefully some potential for big payouts and all the multi-race wagers got that all turf pick three as well that'll end in race 10 anything stick out to you in those full fields in terms of a potential opportunity yeah it looks really good it's one of those cards i've already done and i've gone through and i like barely could circle a horse because it's so tough to figure it just there's no real horses that really stand out in my opinion and including the last race I mean I think there's 12 or 13 horses in that turf race or whatever you said I mean they're all kind of like that they just like there's no standout which is good especially if you like pick fours and pick fives because it looks like you can get a few prices and maybe even some real long shots and it looks like a day that you always say it's not going to chalk out but I really don't <laughs> think that day will chalk out on Friday no I think uh <sighs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, my first pass through, I just thought, man, there's nothing to lean on. And I will say, you know, I've done a lot of research in terms of uh, what long shots actually win. And it's pretty rare that those $200 horses, 90 to one, things like that, get the job done. So there's still an opportunity to maybe eliminate horses. But look, if the three no hopers all take 2% of the pool, that's a huge takeout reduction on the horses you actually do like. So these are the opportunities that, that horse players should get excited about. And I certainly am for that late pick three. Uh, they haven't drawn yet for Saturday, but tons of grade one races there as well for the Breeders' Cup. Any uh, you're locked into, especially in terms of horses you're excited to see run this weekend? 
Um, I'm looking forward to the Futurity. It looks like it's coming up a really good race. Baffert sent Newgate. Um, there's a couple of Pletchers in there. It looks like an interesting because you know the the two turn prep in New York are not they're one turn races. So they I think you have you have Santa Anita this weekend, and then you have um, Keeneland with two turns, and then Churchill had those two turn races a couple of weeks ago. So I think it'll give us a better gauge on the Breeders' Cup Juvenile going forward for the dirt. Um, the Coolmore Mile. It sounds weird to say, not the Shadwell Mile. Um, yeah, that looks like another interesting race. But I think the only – I was looking at the problems. The only uninteresting race to me looks like to be the turf sprint. Golden Pal looks like he's going to lay over that field. But outside of that, all the races look pretty interesting in my opinion. Yeah, agreed. And uh, we get the spinster on Sunday as well to close out the grade one action this weekend. One stat, uh, I had to remind myself just how bad it was because he's one of the best to ever do it. But last October, Steve Asmussen won for 57 at Keeneland. And this is not a meet that's among his better ones to begin with. He's very rarely that bad, if ever. That was his, that was historically putrid. Is that something you've thought about looking at this opening weekend with how bad he was at this meet last year? Or do you just say it's Steve Asmussen, if he fits, he fits? Yeah, it is interesting because in the spring meet, you don't really – because he runs all his horses at Oakland to begin with in the spring meet because their meet runs so long. So you don't really – I don't really pay attention to his numbers in the spring meet. But for, for the fall meet, I mean, you kind of want his horses to run well going into the Breeders' Cup. I know a lot of those horses won't be in the Breeders' Cup. But like you said last year, it was such a bad struggle for him that I think you just pay attention. You also see what horses are running. I think a big problem – a big thing people overreact to, if people – or one for 50, but they're running a bunch of 40 to one shots or whatever. I know he doesn't run 40 to one shots or 20 to one shots, for example. I don't think you put much grain into that, but if he's running a bunch of three to five, seven to twos, five to twos, and they're one for 40, I think you start to pay attention. But at the beginning of the meet, I'll just treat it like last year didn't happen and we'll see how it goes because going into the Breeders' Cup this year, I have a feeling he's going to run some live horses and win some races. Yeah, I lean in that direction, too. And, you know, for as many races as he wins across several circuits, uh, he's not one of those that's always steamy. I mean, he has two-year-olds that will go off four or five to one and run well. So, uh, you know, if he were a, a Pletcher or Chad Brown type where there was this meet where they were so bad, I'd probably wait and see and let him beat me a few times at odds on or even money. Those guys take more money than Steve, though. So, in my mind, I I'm – I'm not going to let it factor if I like his horse, who's not going to be the favorite. I posted another stat uh, looking at the short stretch jockeys, and uh, Keeneland's really interesting in that regard because you get that short uh, run with the mile on the 16th and the mile races on the main track. And I was, I don't want to say shocked. He's a journeyman. He's been around. But I was a little surprised to see Chris Landeros uh, be the top guy uh, when it comes to that configuration. And uh, even Declan, Cannon uh, was up there as well. Another uh, rider who's been around, but you really don't associate with like top of the charts. Uh, I mean, what do you make of that? Is, is it just home yeah. track advantage for those guys or they just popped at a few prices? So they showed up high. And uh, is that something you even consider with those funky short stretch races? Yeah, I don't really put much into that because I don't think I've ever won a race with Landero at Keenan. So I don't know <laughs> when those happened. Um, or Declan Cannon for that matter. But I think in the short stretch, though, you definitely want horses that are closer to the pace because, I mean, that short stretch, the wire comes up so fast. But, no, I don't put much grain into um, um, Declan Cannon and Chris Landeros being the best short tr um, short stretch um, jockeys, which is right, a very well, bizarre stat. It, it, it's interesting. It's what, like – he makes stats say anything a lot of the time. So uh, I'm eager to see if, if either of them can uh, crash a party at a price maybe. And uh, I'll probably be like, I can't believe I didn't bet that horse at 20 to one uh, question for you. I made a bet. I'm curious to hear what side you would be on. Brian Hernandez dirt races at Keeneland. I bet that he would have a flat bet profit this meet dirt only. Any type of race, so sprint, route, maiden, stakes, whatever. I bet Brian, I get $10 every time he runs on the main track dirt. And at the end of the meet, I'm settling up with the person who I made a bet with. What do you think? Hmm. I, I, I might have to. I think he might have a positive flat bet because he rides. He's got a pretty wide variety. Now, he rides for Asmussen. He, you know, he's got Wilkes. He's got McPeak. 
and McPeak never takes money. So if he wins a couple right. races for McPeak, I mean, so you'd be right there. I would probably take a positive. I mean, because I saw that Marty McGee tweeted out the New York jockeys. They really, most of them seem like they're coming on the weekends. So, right. I mean, they're going to take a lot of the, and, you know, Irad, Jose, I think Joel's staying a lot of the meat. Pratt, I think, staying some for the whole, maybe even the whole meat. But I think most of the guys are shipping in and out. So you got Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then on the weekends, I mean, the local jockeys aren't going to take as much money as the big New York guys. So, yeah, I think there's a, I'd probably take a positive flat bet with Brian Hernandez because he right. doesn't really feel like he wins on a lot of favorites, in my opinion. I'm sure he does, but it doesn't feel like he does because he rides for Wilson McPeak and some of those guys that are right. all in the six to seven to one. Right. Yeah, I just feel like uh, th- this is a meet where he can be on a somewhat logical horse for a McPeak, let's say, especially like a two year old stretching out and you get 20 bucks and, uh, you know, you only need a few of those. So. That's my bet. Uh, you know, we'll see. Something to watch. Something to give me some meat long action on Brian. And uh, anything else on Keeneland before we go to the uh, the hot topic of the week to close us out? Um, no, I'm looking forward to this hot topic though. I got a feeling I know what it's going to be about. But no, that's all yeah. I got on Keeneland. Well, and, it, and it's such a hot topic that w- if we had recorded this yesterday, we would have completely missed the newest wrinkle to it, which uh, Shoegate, uh, whatever you want to call it, Eric Reed, uh, in consultation with uh, an, o- an owner he has used in the past, not the actual owner of Rich Strike, but uh, Jem Gochin, uh, who I believe was the owner of Eric's first graded stakes winner, uh, they put in a call to the Kentucky stewards and said, Hey, I want you to look at uh, this shoe situation with hot rod. Charlie pictures look like you might be using uh, some shoes that are not allowed by Hysa. And all that came days after the brouhaha with Sonny Leone and getting uh, the 15 day suspension. And, you know, some people saying that uh, rich strike should have even been maybe placed behind happy saver the Lucas Classic has uh, been the story that is not going away. Yeah, if you watch that race and don't know what happened, you're like, wow, that's a fantastic race. And then you go back and you watch the head on and there's all the Sonny Leon action coming over. I still don't know why he brought the horse over. It looked like he was going right by the horse because <laughs> Hot Rod Charlie is not a horse that, I mean, he's not a winner, but he gave him a chance to fight back. So yeah, that's all another story. And then thing um i saw doug o'neill's tweet he put it on the bible so i mean when you put it on the bible stacks of bibles i get the stacks of bibles so yeah not just one multiple so i i don't know it's gonna get it, the interesting part is if hot rod charlie would have lost the race he would have been placed first for the interference so then you go back and they disqualify hot rod <laughs> charlie for the legal shoes well, then they never had an inquiry. So technically he would, I don't know how that, I don't know how that's all going to unravel. Well, with the, if there is a situation with the shoes that leads to a disqualification, that places him last. So, you know, all the yeah, 100, would but then, second or third. But there's no, there was no inquiry on um, the race because he won the race. So would they put him first because there was no inquiry and then, or would they put him before or rich strike before hot rod Charlie in fifth and the King Fury wins and happy saver comes second. Can oh you yeah. Go back no, and mean, do rich strike inquiry? second happy, happy saver. They lost their chance to claim foul that needed to happen on the track. Well, that's what I'm saying. So if they did disqualify Hot Rod Charlie for the illegal shoes, let's say, would Rich Strike be placed first, even though he fouled? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Hot Rod Charlie. Yeah. That's what I figured. But if it was a, if it would have happened where Hot Rich Strike won the race by a nose, he would have been disqualified. Oh, right. He would have been disqualified to second and then placed first yeah, so, again. Yeah. So there's all that going on, too. No, I guess he would just automatically be placed first. It's a mess. I lied, though. I, I have I have one more question for you. Uh-oh. Everyone talk. Everyone talks about uh, where to go in Lexington and after Keeneland and all that. Where's your go to spot? And don't tell me it's El Nepal and Shelbyville. Okay, first off, I do not eat El Nepal, so do not put that on record. Um, <laughs> on the way there, you have to go to Doe Daddy's, the donut shop right before okay. the track to yeah. the gas station. They have the best by far. And then after the races, I mean, everybody goes to Malone's. I don't know. I would, 
I, if I'm going to go to a steakhouse, I'd rather go to the Ruby than those two. But I'm telling you, I think that no that is on the way to the racetrack. All right, on the way there, that's a guaranteed winner. Uh, better than waiting to see what you can afford after the races. I, I'm with you. I mean, I think Jeff Ruby's is head and shoulders beyond Malone's, but we have a Ruby's here in Louisville along with Matt Wynn. So. I try to get something other than steak. Uh, I've never been to Matt Wynn. It's hard for me to eat at the racetrack, but if I'm already, I don't know, I'd rather go to Ruby's and pay the same amount. Uh, I would say Matt Wynn might even be a little more, but it, it, it well, so I, it was solid. Then I heard they got a new chef and it wasn't so good. Now I heard they're back, pardon the pun, back on track. With that sounds like a chef. Churchill Downs restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed it when it first opened, um, then started hearing mixed reviews. And now lately, uh, since the summer, people have been raving about it again. So, uh, and they're open when they're not running. So, yeah, I don't know. No, maybe, no. maybe I'll try it one day. If I had a big pig five or something, I'll just walk upstairs and get a steak. Maybe. There you go. All right. Well, in the meantime, we're going to try to hit some pick fives and all turf pick threes. And heck, even some win bets might be lucrative. What's the takeout on Keeneland's pick fives? It's 15. good, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what's Churchill? 15. That's what I thought. Okay, yeah. yeah. And what is New York? Uh, 15 on the pick five, but they get you on the pick four. The pick four. Yeah, that's what it is. That's the difference. Yeah, which here it's uh, 22 and a half. So a so little not bit. a huge difference, but a little bit. And we got the penny yeah. breakage. And the penny, yeah, that that's big. And uh, those show parlays, very popular at Keeneland among the live crowd. And uh, they're going to get some extra money this meet as well, thanks to the penny breakage. And thanks I to you, David, say, for joining us. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. I would say this is going to be a record meet, too. You can just oh. feel it. You can feel it because Churchill Absolutely. was up for their meet. There was no turf <laughs> race. Everybody's lost because they don't know if they're betting Belmont or Aqueduct. So yep. you just. You just kind of feel like it's going to be a yeah, Gulf, Gulfstream is, you know, with no turf. Uh, they've taken a hit this year. Southern California is just trending downward, period. Backwaduct is is struggling <laughs> handle-wise. This is 100%. If there were a line, I would take I would take minus 500 on record handle. 100%. And Saratoga crushed their record, which was the premier meet before Keeneland. I would say it kind of just feels like it's trending in that direction. Yeah. So. But what I really want, more than anything, is record sales for the Paddock Prince. Uh, that's what I want too, and record winners. I don't want record to collab- winners. I don't want the to sales collab- will come with winners. I've done well at Keeneland in the past, so hopefully that continues as well. Yeah. All right. Well, my I'm doing some picks as well for the uh, the Keeneland website, giving some HRN stats on there. Throw up some uh, spot plays, but certainly for full card analysis and wagering topics, uh, Paddock Prince, the way to go. Uh, link is scrolling there at the bottom. You can get it for all of Keeneland. And uh, we'll talk next week ahead of the uh, QE2. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. All right. Paddock Prince, everybody. Get a sheet, like, and subscribe to our video. And we'll be back next week.